Okay, so let's talk now about completable futures. We'll, we'll talk about what they do as opposed to talk about what's lame with the things that aren't them. So I'll talk about some of the, the key basic features of completable futures and outline some of the advanced features. We won't really cover the advanced features till a little bit later. This will give you an overview of what things do. So the Java 8 completable futures capability is basically a framework, and it allows you to have an asynchronous or so-called reactive concurrent programming model with Java, which really wasn't quite there with the earlier versions, sadly. And what it allows you to do is it allows you to have these chains of dependent actions that get triggered fluently as asynchronous operations complete. And so you can basically write programs that have a data flow-like dependency where later tasks run only when the earlier tasks complete. So here's a very simple example. This is sort of like your next programming assignment, kind of a stripped-down version. You're going to start some kind of download asynchronously, and then once the download of a web page completes, you're going to count the number of images on the current page asynchronously, and then you're also going to count the number of images on all the hyperlink pages asynchronously, and then you're going to combine all the results back together to make the total asynchronously, right? So all these things will run asynchronously, and these tasks, task two and three, can't run until this task is done, and this task, task four, can't run until tasks two and three are done. So you can kind of see it's like a, it's like a data flow diagram of different operations that are being woven together to do some overall computation. So we can model them as a data flow diagram with dependencies. Here's just a more detailed view of this, and this is kind of what the code looks like with uh, a little bit of pseudocode just to make it fit on one page and not be too complicated. So we'll see here that there's a, a method that's part of the completable futures API called supply async, and we'll start by downloading a web page asynchronously. That supply async operation will return to us a future to the web page, which, when completed, will allow the next computations to run. So you can see we can start it up here, get a future back, then we can write some more code, and this code here will basically do some work once the page has been downloaded, and that'll go and count the number of images on the page asynchronously. And over here, we're going to go ahead and, when this thing is done, we're going to count the number of images on the page that are reachable by this page asynchronously. So this will return a future to a single number, which is the number of images on that page that are directly there. And this will return an array of numbers, of integers, for the counts of the number of images reachable from all the other pages that are linkable from this page, right? So we're composing these things. And then we're going to go ahead and take all those results, and we're going to combine them back together again in order to be able to take the number of images that were available through the links on the page, the number of images that were available on the page, and then we're going to sum them all together, and then we'll return a completable future to that. So the whole thing will be done asynchronously, and it's actually not until you finally need the final result, like the number of images that were downloaded and counted in total, that you ever have to block. So everything's going to be running asynchronously. And these asynchronous operations, as you can see, can be forked. We can fork them. We can chain them. And then we can join them back together again as they complete. And the magic of all this is something that's called a completion stage. And I'll talk more about what completion stages are shortly. These asynchronous operations can run in, in a pool of threads. And it's either a pool of threads that comes out of the box, like the common fork join pool, or it's a pool of threads that you can designate through various means. So you can either do it by using something like a, a, a cache thread pool or a fixed size thread pool. You can make your own thread pool. Whatever you want to do, you can decide how to, how to download things concurrently if you choose. So what does this give us? What this gives us is the ability to overcome the limitations we talked about before with Java futures. So we're going to slay the, slay the dragon of complexity that existed with the previous versions. So here are some examples. One thing you can do with completable futures that you could not have done with the earlier versions of futures is you can complete them explicitly. And I, I started out by trying to get a Jerry Maguire movie picture, but that was just too obscure. So I figured uh, this is 
you complete me, right? The, the donut hole with the, and the donut, right? They complete each other. Um, this is what this means in terms of code. We can start a thread of control that's running, doing some long-running computation, and we can let other things happen in the main thread while that thread's running in the background. And when this guy finally decides, the main thread decides it needs to get the result, it just says future.join, and it'll block until it's ready. Um, and when the computation is done, this background thread can say future.complete and give it a result. So when the, the dot complete method is called, that'll set the value, which I indicate here as dot, 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 to whatever the value needs to be. And then that means the future is completed, and that will trigger the code down here to return from join. So that's how you can explicitly complete a computation. And I'll show you a bunch of examples of that. Another thing you can do with completable futures that's really cool, and it's actually to some extent reminiscent of the Java parallel stream stuff we talked about, or the Java stream stuff, you can chain together these completion stage methods so that the output of one serves as the input to the next one in the chain. So this is fluent programming in an asynchronous completion model, which is really, really cool. So here's an example. Um, I'll show you this example in more detail later, but for the short term, here's what's going on. We've got some computation up here that's going to uh, reduce fraction is some kind of method reference or lambda function that's going to basically uh, you know, take a big fraction and reduce it, right? It's going to reduce its not, uh, denominator and its numerator. And we're going to do that asynchronously. And, after, and, and, and supply async returns a completable future to whatever the result is here. Then, after we've reduced it, we're then going to go ahead and convert the result of the reduction into a mixed string. And you guys probably all know what a mixed string representation of a fraction is. You have a fraction like, I don't know, um, 18 fourths or something like that, right? And you reduce it to be, you know, four and two fourths. I think I got that right. You know, so, so basically 18 fourths becomes four and two fourths, right? You, you reduce it to a, or you, you turn it into a mixed string where you have an integer followed by a reduced fraction. And then the last thing we do after that's done is then we go ahead and we print the result. So we do this asynchronously, reduce the fraction asynchronously. After that's done, we take the result and we convert it into a mixed string. And after that's done, we then go ahead and print the results out. So notice how each of these actions in this little fluent chain of completion stage methods is triggered when the future from the previous stage completes asynchronously. Really cool. And it should look a little bit like the stream stuff we've been looking at, right? We have a pipeline of operations. This is kind of a pipeline of completion stage actions that are triggered. And the other thing you can do that's really cool is you can actually collect a bunch of asynchronous futures or, or futures to completable futures to asynchronous computations. And then you can go ahead and wait for all those things to complete through a single point. So here's what we're doing. Here's an example of how we're triggering this. Um, we're going to go ahead. This, this particular code is kind of cool. We generate a bunch of fractions. I think they're called improper fractions. And we're going to generate you know, max fractions of them. We're going to reduce them to be reduced fractions, so they're no longer improper fractions, they're now reduced fractions. And then we're going to collect all the completable futures to these asynchronous computations, which are now all off running. There could be hundreds of these things, depends on how big S, mass X, S max fractions is. All those things are now running asynchronously. We collect them up into a single completable future to a list of big fractions. And then only when that future completes, which only completes after all the other futures that are running complete, with it, we then go ahead and print out the results. So this is going to allow us to have a single place to wait for lots and lots and lots of asynchronous computations to finish. And that is something you simply couldn't have done with the earlier versions of Java uh, futures. They didn't make that 
really feasible in any efficient way. Okay, so those are some of the, the three main things we can do. And the nice part about this is we can also, this, this example also illustrates how we can combine futures, completable futures, with streams. So just like Reese's peanut butter cups combine chocolate and peanut butter in a tastier way, arguably. I actually ran into a person the other day who said, I actually don't like Reese's peanut butter cups, which, which just shocked me, right? I was like, how could you possibly not like a Reese's peanut butter cup? It's like the best candy ever made. But she didn't like it, so everybody has their own taste. But the point is that you can combine the asynchronous features of completable futures with the ability to chain things together in pipelines as streams. And this is a good example. We'll see other examples later. Okay, so let's talk about some of the, the very basic features of completable futures, which, by the way, look almost identical to what futures give you. So these are very basic features. So it's basically the future API that you get because a completable future implements future, right? Future is an interface. Completable future implements that interface. So it has all of these methods plus a handful more, like complete, for example, and join. But it's basically more or less the same thing that we already had, just a little bit nicer. And I'll show you how much nicer shortly. There's also a more advanced set of features. And these are sort of the Swiss Army knife of features. And as you'll see, there's about some 60 plus methods in the interface for uh, the completable future. So it's pretty massive class with a, ba a massive interface. And it does a lot of really cool things. It's a little bit, in a little bit intimidating when you first see the class because it's just so huge. But when you break it all down into pieces, as we will do shortly, it, it's really quite tractable. So of those other gazillion methods, they fall into three main categories. Factory methods, which are used to initiate asynchronous computations one way or two way, in, in a one way or two way manner. We'll talk about that. Two way simply means you get a result back. One way means you don't get a result back. You can also have what are called chaining methods. And these are methods that serve as the completion stage for async result processing and composition. And that happens because completable future also inherits or implements the completion stage interface. So that's all the methods here. And then the final thing that they provide, which is just a sort of a microscopic set of capabilities, are the so-called arbitrary arity methods, which is a fancy way of saying that they can have any number of parameters, uh, like an array of parameters. So we'll talk about the arbitrary arity methods like all of and any of. Okay, so that's just a brief overview of what the interface looks like. And I did it that way give you the big picture view before we start diving into the details.